b. The stages of the state of exaltation. Reformed theology distinguishes for stages in the exaltation of Christ. 1. The resurrection. a. The nature of the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ did not consist in the mere fact that he came to life again, and that body and soul were reunited. If this were all that it involved, he could not be called, the first fruits of them that slept, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, nor, the firstborn of the dead, Colonel. 118, Revelation 1 verse 5, since others were restored to life before him. It consisted rather in this that in him human nature, both body and soul, was restored to its pristine strength and perfection and even raised to a higher level, while body and soul were reunited in a living organism. From the analogy of the change which, according to scripture, takes place in the body of believers in the general resurrection, we may gather something as to the transformation that must have occurred in Christ. Paul tells us in I Cor. 15 42-44 that the future body of believers will be incorruptible, that is, incapable of decay, glorious, which means resplendent with heavenly brightness, powerful, that is, instinct with energy and perhaps with new faculties, and spiritual, which does not mean immaterial or ethereal, but adapted to the spirit, a perfect instrument of the spirit. From the Gospel story we learn that the body of Jesus had undergone a remarkable change, so that he was not easily recognized and could suddenly appear and disappear in a surprising manner. Luke 24 verses 31 and 36, John 20 verses 13 and 19, 21 verse 7, but that it was nevertheless a material and very real body, Luke 24 verse 39. This does not conflict with 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50, for, flesh and blood is a description of human nature in its present material, mortal, and corruptible state. But the change that takes place in believers is not only bodily, but also spiritual. Similarly, there was not only a physical, but also a psychical change in Christ. We cannot say that any religious or ethical change took place in him, but he was endowed with new qualities perfectly adjusted to his future heavenly environment. Through the resurrection he became the life giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45. The resurrection of Christ had a threefold. Significance, 1, it constituted a declaration of the Father that the last enemy had been vanquished, the penalty paid, and the condition on which life was promised, met. 2, it symbolized what was destined to happen to the members of Christ's mystical body in their justification, spiritual birth, and future blessed resurrection, Rom 6 4, 5, 9, 8, 11, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14, 15 verses 20 to 22, 2 Cor 4 colon 10, 11, 14, Colossians 2 verse 12, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 14. 3. It is also connected instrumentally with their justification, regeneration, and final resurrection. Romans 4 verse 25, 5 verse 10, Ephesians 1 verse 20, Phil 3 10, 1 Peter 1 verse 3. P. Furious Smiley P. B the author of the resurrection. In distinction from others who were raised from the dead, Christ arose through his own power. He spoke of himself as the resurrection and the life, John 11 verse 25, declared that he had the power to lay down his life, and to take it up again, John 10 verse 18, and even predicted that he would rebuild the temple of his body, John 2 verses 19 to 21. But the resurrection was not a work of Christ alone, it is frequently ascribed to the power of God in general. Acts 2 verses 24 and 32, 3 verse 26, 5 verse 30, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14, Ephesians 1 verse 20, or, more particularly, to the Father, Romans 6 verse 4, Galatians 1 verse 1, 1 Peter 1 verse 3. And if the resurrection of Christ can be called a work of God, then it follows that the Holy Spirit was also operative in it, for all the opera ad extra are works of the triune God. Moreover, Romans 8 verse 11 also implies this. C. Objection to the doctrine of the resurrection. One great objection is urged against the doctrine of a physical resurrection, namely, that after death the body disintegrates, and the various particles of which it is composed enter into the composition of other bodies, vegetable, animal, and human. Hence it is impossible to restore these particles to all the bodies of which, in the course of time, they formed a part. Macintosh asks, what became of the atoms of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen? hydrogen, and other elements which composed the earthly body of Jesus. Theology as an empirical science, p. 77, now we admit that the resurrection defies explanation. It is a miracle. 
but at the same time we should bear in mind, that the identity of a resurrection body with the body that descended into the grave does not require that it be composed of, exactly the same particles. The composition of our bodies changes right along, and yet they retain their identity. Paul in. I call 15 maintains the essential identity of the body that descends into the grave with that which is raised up, but also declares emphatically that the form changes. That which man sows in the earth passes through a process of death, and is then quickened, but in form the grain which he puts into the ground is not the same as that which he reaps in due time. God gives to each seed a body of its own. So it is also in the resurrection of the dead. It may be that there is some nucleus, some germ, that constitutes the essence of the body and preserves its identity. The argument of the Apostle in I Cor. 15 35-38 seems to imply something of the kind, compared to Kuiper, E Voto 2, pp. 248 ff, Milligan, The Resurrection of the Dead, pp. 117 ff. It should be. Born in mind that the real, the fundamental objection to the resurrection, is its supernatural character. It is not lack of evidence, but the fundamental tenet that miracles cannot happen, that stands in the way of its acceptance. Even liberal scholars admit that no fact is better attested than the resurrection of Christ, though others, of course, deny this. But this makes little difference to the modern scholar. Says Dr. Rashdall, were the testimony fifty times stronger than it is, any hypothesis would be more possible than that. Yet at the present time many eminent scientists frankly declare that they are not in a position to say that miracles cannot happen. Threat. D. Attempts to explain away the fact of the resurrection. In their denial the anti-supernaturalists always run up against the story of the resurrection in the Gospels. The story of the empty tomb and of the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection present a challenge to them, and they accept the challenge and attempt to explain these without accepting the fact of the resurrection. The following attempts are some of the most important. 1. The Fossard Theory. This is to the effect that the disciples practiced deliberate deception by stealing the body from the grave and then declaring that the Lord had risen. The soldiers who watched the grave were instructed to circulate that story, and Celsus already urged it in explanation of the empty tomb. This theory, of course, impugns the veracity of the early witnesses, the apostles, the women, the 500 brethren, and others. But it is extremely unlikely that the faint-hearted disciples would have had the courage to palm off such a fossil upon a hostile world. It is impossible to believe that they would have persisted in suffering for such a bare fossil. Moreover, only the facts of the resurrection can explain the indomitable courage and power which they reveal in witnessing to the resurrection of Christ. These considerations soon led to the abandonment of this view. 2. The Swoon Theory According to this theory, Jesus did not really die, but merely fainted, while it was thought that he had actually died. But this naturally raises several questions that are not easy to answer. How can it be explained that so many people were deceived, and that the spear thrust did not kill Jesus? How could Jesus in his exhausted condition roll away the stone from the grave and then walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus and back? How is it that the disciples did not treat him as a sick person, but saw in him the powerful Prince of Life? And what became of Jesus after that? With the resurrection the ascension is naturally ruled out also. Did he then return to some unknown place and live in secret the rest of his life? This theory is burdened with so many improbabilities that even Strauss ridiculed it. 3. The Vision Theory. This was presented in two forms. A. Some speak of purely subjective visions. In their excited state of mind the disciples dwelt so much on the Saviour and on the possibility of his return to them, that at last they actually thought they saw him. The spark was applied by the nervous and excitable Mary Magdalene, and soon the flame was kindled and spread. This has been the favourable theory for a long time, but it too is freighted with difficulties. How could such visions arise, seeing that the disciples did not expect the resurrection? How could they appear while the Disciples were about their ordinary business and not given to prayer or meditation. Could the rapture or ecstasy required for the creation of subjective visions have started as early as the third day? Would not the disciples in such visions have seen Jesus either as surrounded with a halo of heavenly glory, or just as they had known him and eager to renew fellowship with them? Do subjective visions ever present themselves to several persons simultaneously? 
how can we account for the visionary conversations? b. In view of the extreme weakness of this theory some scholars presented a different version of it. They claim that the disciples saw real objective visions, miraculously sent by God, to persuade them to go on with the preaching of the gospel. This does really avoid some of the difficulties suggested, but encounters others. It admits the supernatural, and if this is necessary, why not grant the resurrection, which certainly explains all the facts. Moreover, this theory asks us to believe that these divinely sent visions were such as to mislead the apostles. Does God seek to work his ends by deception? 4. Mythical theories. A new mythical school has come into existence, which discards, or at least dispenses with, theories of vision and apparition, and seeks to account for the resurrection legend by the help of conceptions. Imported into Judaism from Babylonia and other Oriental countries. This school claims not only that the mythology of the ancient Oriental religions contains analogies of the resurrection story, but that this story was actually derived from pagan myths. This theory has been worked out in several forms, but is equally baseless in all its forms. It is characterized by great arbitrariness in bolstering up a connection of the gospel story with heathen myths, and has not succeeded in linking them together. Moreover, it reveals an extreme disregard of the facts as they are found in scripture. e. The doctrinal bearing of the resurrection. The question arises, does it make any difference, whether we believe in the physical resurrection of Christ, or merely in an ideal resurrection? For modern liberal theology the resurrection of Jesus, except in the sense of a spiritual survival, has no real importance for Christian faith. Belief in the bodily resurrection is not essential, but can very well be dropped without affecting the Christian religion. Barth and Brunner are of a different opinion. They do believe in the historical fact of the resurrection, but maintain that as such it is merely a matter of history, with which the historian may deal to the best of his ability, and not as a matter of faith. The important element is that in the resurrection the divine breaks into the course of history, that in it the incognito of Jesus is removed and God reveals himself. The historian cannot describe it, but the believer accepts it by faith. Belief in the resurrection certainly has doctrinal bearings. We cannot deny the physical resurrection of Christ without impugning the veracity of the writers of Scripture, since they certainly represent it as a fact. This means that it affects our belief in the trustworthiness of Scripture. Moreover the resurrection of Christ is represented as having evidential value. It was the culminating proof that Christ was a teacher sent from God, the sign of Jonah, and that he was the very Son of God, Romans 1 verse 4. It was also the supreme attestation of the fact of immortality. What is still more important, the resurrection enters as a constitutive element into the very essence of the work of redemption, and therefore of the gospel. It is one of the great foundation stones of the Church of God. The atoning work of Christ, if it was to be effective at all, had to terminate, not in death, but in life. Furthermore, it was the Father's seal on the completed work of Christ, the public declaration of its acceptance. In it Christ passed from under the law. Finally, it was his entrance on a new life as the risen and exalted head of the church and the universal Lord. This enabled him to apply the fruits of his redemptive work.